So thank you, Inga, for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I'm a professor at the Department of Pharmacological Sciences, and I have a computational biology lab. And today I'm going to talk to you uh, in general terms about how we approach uh, basic science uh, drug and target discovery via data mining. We are a part of several NIH-funded uh, centers. One of them is called the uh, LINX. Another one is called IDG. And we are the, acting as the data coordination center for those programs. Those are very large uh, multi-center programs that are funded by the NIH Common Fund, which is a fund to sponsor uh, large risky projects that it usually run for 10 years and uh, are funded across all of the NIH institutes. I joined Mount Sinai as a PhD student in uh, 2002 um, and I since then spent my whole career at Mount Sinai so it's now already 18 years and when you join Mount Sinai as a PhD student you're supposed to look for a project and at the time I visited the Iyengar lab who is on the 12th floor of the ICANN building and what they tried to do already in 1999 was they tried to sketch how cell signaling pathways are connected into networks and uh, so what you see here is a whiteboard that amazingly is still there on the floor where they tried to um, put in all of their knowledge about cell signaling pathways. So these double black lines represent the membrane of a cell. And then you can see that there are like some cell surface receptors that are transmembrane proteins. And then there's those proteins that are inside the cells and they're all connected through those arrows. It's like a wiring diagram that abstract how a cell listen to signals from the outside and then pass the signal inside like a electronic circuit. So my background was uh, in computer science. I received both a um, bachelor's and a master's degree in computer science and also worked as a programmer for about four or five years in two different mid-sized companies. So I really liked that project because it combined the biology that I was learning at the PhD program with the computer science background that I had. So long story short, I expanded that network. I took that as my project to analyze the topology of that network. And uh, for that, I had to read a lot of papers to understand how cell signaling pathways are established. So at the time, most of the papers in the field were describing biochemical interactions between proteins and metabolites and protein-protein interactions. The uh, scale of uh, talking about either one or two proteins at the time. So I had to read a lot of papers and my goal was that if I read all those papers, I could figure out how cells are regulated, how, do, how those wiring diagram is actually used to control uh, cellular phenotypes. So we came up with this map and it was a first author paper in science in 2005 and this you see it's like a blob of connections that are extracted from publications, single publications, trying to get a, a global picture of how this network works. And although it was published in Science, and we've done a lot of analysis of trying to understand the topology of this network, I can't say that I still that I actually understand how you know cells are regulated from a network perspective. And as part of this publication, there was a news and views article that came with it, and. Uh, in there they try to describe or place the our work in the context of other ways people model biochemical networks and the, the this diagram shows that you can have very few genes and a lot of details so if you know exactly how they interact like stoichiometry uh, stoichiometrically 
and you can also uh, abstract the circuit and this is like the types of models that are used ODEs you can also have those boolean networks that uh, look at components inside the cell the switches and then what we've done is just looking at topology and uh, introducing flows into the connectivity and trying to figure out like where are the feedback loops how modules are formed and how those modules process information since then my career uh, I spent in I realized that this is still too complicated we still don't have the tools the experimental uh, tools and the computational tools to really understand the cells at that connectivity level and I've been working really in a even more simplified uh, analysis and I will talk about that type of work of um, dealing with biological data at a very abstract and even more simplified uh, less detailed than those networks so when I uh, at Mount Sinai when I graduated I was uh, lucky to uh, be offered to start my own group and one of our first project was this a tool called Kia which is kinase enrichment analysis and for Kia we integrated data from six databases and they created this web app where you can come in and uh, submit your uh, list of proteins and then you get a ranked list of uh, kinases that are potentially overrepresented to phosphorylate those proteins so this was a new thing to do. C enrichment analysis uh, was already available, but no one thought of doing it for kinase substrate interactions. So we had this uh, tool that we could offer for identifying kinases, given typically uh, publications from uh, technologies called phosphoproteomics or proteomics, where you see differences in uh, phosphorylation under different conditions. We also a year later uh, published a very similar approach for uh, by collecting data from CheapSeq. So CheapSeq was just a new method that started uh, at that time and uh, that paper also got a lot of attention um, where we collected uh, I think Right now, it's uh, over 300 uh, cheap six uh, publications that profile transcription factors with a list of the targets that transcription factor is uh, identified to bind in the proximity to. And what you can do with such a database, you can put in your uh, differentially expressed genes from uh, microarrays or RNA seq studies or other cheap studies and then you can identify the transcription factors that are most likely regulating those uh, downstream changes that you observe from those uh, genome-wide methods. So this is also another way to sort of like innovatively use enrichment analysis and data that is available in the public domain, organize it, collect it, and make it available as an app which we've been doing for now many years so there are as we uh, you know after we did those two apps we realized that there's a lot of other sources and those databases and sources of um, omics type of data are emerging and growing very rapidly so there is a sort of like a data explosion in a molecular systems biology or big data, biochemical, and cell, bi cell biology research. And the challenge is really how you bring all this data together and how you use it for, um, how do you reuse it and combine it. So in principle, we um, looking at it from a computer science type of uh, view, we can simplify the type of data that we have into five categories so it's uh, everything around genes and those can be proteins they can be target 
those genes can form modules, uh, complexes, and pathways. Uh, those pathways can be found in different cell types, tissues, and then um, there are those drugs that uh, can be uh, targeting specific genes, they can target a specific pathway, they can have efficacy in a specific cell type or cell line, and they also can cause uh, adverse events or have some indications that are desired. So the point is that with those uh, general types of um, entities, and there are phenotypes and adverse events, sort of like at the organism level. So those type of entities, those objects, can be connected. So everything here is connected, and a lot of people are working in the space of finding connections or understanding connections between usually two of those domains. So to make it a little bit more practically, we published a paper in 2014 that show you, guide you exactly how you can start connecting those databases by uh, abstracting the data into gene sets. And these are some of those connections. So you can take drugs and you can see how drugs affect cells, whether they, so the CCLE and CTD square is a effort to um, see how lists of drugs kill a, uh, an array of cancer cell lines. The Lynx project profile those cell lines with gene expression data. You can also find information about those drugs targets from a database called Drug Bank. You can see what side effects those drugs cause with uh, resources like CIDR. And then um, there are disease genes. So all of those things are, first, you sort of like have to be familiar with those important resources that everyone is using and then find ways to start combining them. And then once you start combining them, you can find all kind of interesting relationships and you can develop tools that enable people to find all of those relationships as well as you can do what uh, I will talk about a little bit more, which is impute knowledge, which is using machine learning to fill in the gaps and uh, discover things just using the computer. So this is a little bit more uh, specifics of how you go about doing this data abstraction. So here there are seven different modalities of uh, ways to convert data or sources of data of different types and what we've done we converted all those data types into networks gene set libraries and bipartite graphs so those are interchangeable data structures so if you convert it into one you should be able to get the other data structures and the seven um, modalities are uh, drugs and gene knockdown followed by expression uh, transcription factor binding, chip seek like I showed you, chia, a drug knockdown or effect on cell viability, mutations in genes and disease uh, connections between genes and disease phenotypes, gene expression from a uh, basal gene expression from tissues and cells, protein protein interactions and pathway information, uh, drugs and a uh, toxic chemicals relationship to adverse events and phenotypes. So we uh, worked, like there was a postdoc in the lab that went to all those resources and wrote scripts to convert all this data into association between genes and their attributes. And uh, he was able to extract 72 million associations from 66 resources to generate 114 data sets. And all of this data is served on this tool called Harmonizom. And Harmonizom, is has been really like a um, successful uh, resource in May of 2000 of 2020 we had 28,000 unique users accessing the harmonizum so another app that our lab developed is called enricher enricher is a search engine where people come in with their gene sets and then it compares their gene sets to 
all of the annotated gene sets that we created. So right now we already have um, over 300,000 uh, gene sets and we had uh, 25 million uh, list analyzed. Here it's an uh, old screenshot from the tool from uh, about a year ago. So the real opportunity of having all this data organized is that we can start impute knowledge with machine learning and one way one thing to do is for example find drug targets so to do that uh, to set up a machine learning problem you can have the genes as the rows of uh, data tables and then the columns can be uh, the expression of those genes for example in tissues the changes in expression of those genes before and after drug treatment you can have the gene product expression so there's also proteomics data from cells memberships in pathways and other type of literature based data and you can concatenate all those matrices of data <coughs> about known genes or genes that have that data and then you can impute knowledge by guilt by association using various type of machine learning algorithms so for example here if you want to predict uh, knockout phenotype for a mouse. There are about 4,000 genes that have been knocked out in mice, so there are still a lot of genes that haven't been tested uh, for knockout. And if we have some desired no uh, phenotype, for example, low cholesterol or um, extended lifespan, so some mice, if you knock their a specific gene down, you'll, they'll have lower level of cholesterol. They will have, uh, they will live twice as long. So that actually, there are some genes that actually cause that phenotype. So we want to find them as potential target for the future, and then we can use this approach to predict or prioritize additional uh, genes for performing this uh, those experiments. And this can be done now relatively easily through uh, libraries. Uh, like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn. TensorFlow is a library developed by Google that is an open source library that a lot of people are using to perform those machine learning tasks. So there is really a skewness in biology and biomedical research for studying specific genes. So this is a plot that tried to quantify the how much a money is spent on investigating a specific gene and this is an estimate but you can see that it's very uneven so this is uh, the y-axis is billions of dollars spent to study a specific target or specific gene and what we see is also there are um, three families of drug targets that have a lot of members that are poorly invested in so there are some kinases, ion channels, and G-protein coupled receptors that receive very little attention and they could be potential targets. So those three families of proteins, they are serving more than 50% of the uh, druggable targets that uh, we have currently drugs for and we do not know a lot about most members of those families. So this is uh, attempted to be addressed by a NIH program called the Illuminating the Druggable Genome. And they're focusing on studying those understudied targets from those three families. And we are a part of that project. We are the data coordination center for that project together with a group at the uh, University of New Mexico. So how did we actually were able to count the money that is spent on a specific gene. So this is an estimate obviously, but the way we've done it, we went to a database called Reporter, and Reporter has information about all of the funded uh, principal investigators in the United States, and there are about 20,000 of them that have some type of grant that from the NIH 
and then we took their names and we searched their names on PubMed to get all of the publications that those investigators published throughout their career and then what we've done we took those lists of publications and we looked for genes in those publications and we've done that using three methods so we used gene riff we use auto riff and we use this other method called tagger so those three methods in general they are ways to convert a publication or make a link between a publication and a gene and once we have that we can just sum up the dollars uh, for each PI for each gene and then we can have a plot of like how much money is spent on a gene so a little bit about those ways to uh, convert publications to genes so this is um, the first resource is called gene riff and this is a resource that is maintained by uh, NCBI with the National Center for Biomedical Informatics and it's a part of the NLM, the National Library of Medicine and they have people that go through papers manually and they associate a gene ID to the publication and they also have some text explaining the relationship between the gene and its function and this is a manual effort and what we found is that they have some gaps so for example if you look at the contribution to this database uh, there's some periods where for specific genes that there's missing information so what we've done is that we simply uh, did a search for each gene and recorded the publications that were returned every year and now we just have a much greater coverage of gene publication association and this is called autoref but it's possibly less accurate than GeneRiff because GeneRiff was done manually. So we've developed this app called GeneShot and with GeneShot what you can do, you can put in any search term, you can search PubMed and then what it does, it converts the search term to a gene set. So for example if you put in autophagy and you select autoref, you get all of the uh, counts for each gene that were mentioned with autophagy. So the number one gene on PubMed that is mentioned in autophagy is this ATG5 and there are 2145 publications that were returned for it. If you do it now you probably get more because uh, this is automatically gets updated because PubMed is just keep continually expanding and you may get different ranking. So GeneShot provides two tables. On the left is the table of the um, counts from publications and on the right there is uh, what we call it's a prediction, a set of predictions for genes that potentially should be associated with autophagy but there's no evidence that they are. So the way we are doing it is that we are basically predicting additional genes based on the known genes that are mentioned with autophagy and I'm going to explain how we do it. So we're doing it based on a uh, co-expression. So we have processed, uh, now it's over half a million RNA-seq samples from the gene expression omnibus and created this resource called Arches4. So f with Arches4 you can uh, come to the interface and identify uh, samples, let's say for a specific tissue, and you can visualize all those samples using this uh, interactive plot and we also used it to predict uh, gene function and protein-protein interactions. So if you think about the data you have the genes as the rows and then you have the half a million RNA-6 samples as the columns and every square in, the, in this plot represent a value of expression. So you can take this huge matrix of data and you can can convert it to this gene gene correlation co co-expression matrix and you can see that there's like those clusters of genes that are have high correlation so this is the clustering 
of gene gene correlation across all uh, the human genes and then what you can do you can take um, a set of genes and s uh, look at how they are um, on average correlated to another genes that is not a part of the set so using that approach we have we are making those predictions so for example we have this what, uh, what we call gene set library from the keg database so those are gene sets that are associated with pathways and then we can rank those pathways based on their co-expression with these genes uh, that gene is called beta resting so beta resting is already known to be a part of the all factory transaction so this is why this uh, entry number six is highlighted in cyan but it's not known to be associated with synaptic vesicle cycle so but it has the most the highest co-expression correlation with that pathway or with the genes that are in that pathway so this way we can do we can make predictions about the likelihood that that gene is a member of that pathway even though it hasn't been annotated and all of those predictions are listed in this uh, landing page for these genes uh, for this gene in the Archers 4 database. We also can predict gene function very similarly using enricher co-occurrence data. So enricher was the search engine that I mentioned to you and what we've done we took um, the now it's 25 million submissions to Enricher and we create a co-occurrence uh, network so this is um, if you think about the Enricher queries enrich people that use Enricher they come in with a gene set and then um, this is a binary set so if you think about all genes the genes that are in the set are labeled as one so you have this type of like visualization of that data you have the genes as the rows and the queries those 25 million queries as the columns and you can take all that data and we can also create a gene gene co-occurrence network and then this is a clustered gene gene co-occurrence networks for just the illustration and then we can use the same way to predict gene functions with enricher and then we can check, like let's say we can check if the co-expression works better than this co-occurrence from enricher and you can see that the co-occurrence from enricher is working very well we can also use co-occurrence in the literature using tagger, autoref, for genref and we can benchmark those and we can see that the literature-based co-occurrence uh, resources they predict very well literature types of data but the other methods the co-expression and the co-occurrence is predicting very well the data driven or the omics data that is less biased so one of the issues with the literature is that there is this bias of studying it's not just the money that is spent on the genes it's the number of publications that those genes accumulate and then there is more likelihood that people continue to study the same genes so this is just a summary of the gene shot application. You can come to it with uh, either a single gene and get predictions about what that gene is doing. You can come to it with a search term and then get a rank list of known association and predicted associations. And you can also come with a gene set and then you can get additional genes that should be a part of that set. And this was published last year uh, by a group. You can try it. Uh, so what I showed you so far is the uh, predictions uh, for uh, making predictions about genes or target the targets based on combining different types of uh, data you can also do this for drugs so here's a machine learning setup to predict the side effects of drugs and this is a paper that we published four years ago and here the drugs are the rows and uh, 
we have in this particular case, uh, I think it's a 20,000 uh, drugs, and only some of them have adverse events. So there are only uh, over a thousand uh, drugs that have, you know, that are marketed drugs, and the rest of those drugs are experimental drugs. But we know there are uh, morphological changes when they apply to cells, so those are features, image features. Uh, of before and after drug treatment. We know the chemical composition so we can extract the fragments of those of their chemical composition and we also have gene expression for those drugs uh, based on um, an approach that measure gene expression in high throughput by treating those drugs uh, by treating, treating human cell lines with those drugs. And then you can build a classifier that or predictor that predicts adverse event for existing drugs but also for a uh, drugs that are still in um, you know under investigation before they're actually used in people and what we can see from the results is that some adverse events are very predictable and some adverse events are not very predictable so this is why we see this bimodal distribution of the uh, area under the curves and we can see that when we use um, chemical features with the gene expression we do doing better than using the morphological features or the chemical features by themselves or each of those types of data by themselves so by combining Two of those data sets we got the best results. So I mentioned to you this project about treating uh, drugs, treating cells with uh, thousands of drugs and measuring gene expression before and after uh, the drug treatment. This started in 2006 in this paper called the connectivity map and basically they people at the Broad Institute developed this resource that can be used uh, in the following way. So you can come to the resource with your own experiments. You either profile uh, human tissue or a cell line and let's say you compare disease uh, tissue versus normal or a disease mouse to a normal mouse and then you also um, can also treat like let's say a cell of a drug or you can knock out a gene and then you do your gene expression analysis typically with RNA-seq and then you get up and down genes and now you want to find small molecules that either mimic or reverse your signature so you want as potential therapeutics or as potential uh, probes that you can use in your experiments to further investigate your system so those connections can be found by querying this resource of thousands or a million of signatures that were created by those experiments that in high throughput me measure the changes in expression using uh, drugs. And to do that, the Broad uh, utilized this technology called the L1000. So it's called the L1000 because they measure able to measure in high throughput only 978 genes or that's close to a thousand and what they do they impute the expression of the rest of the genes so the selection of those 1000 genes was done using a computational approach to find which genes have the most information or the most their most orthogonal genes that can uh, capture the variance in the data so you don't have to measure everything and they can show that it's recovering 80% of the real signal when compared to methods that measure all the genes. So, so far they profiled uh, over 20,000 compounds. A lot of them are bioactive compounds and all of the FDA approved drugs are included. They also knocked down <coughs> and overexpressed uh, all genes with shRNA and uh, overexpressed with cDNA and they're going to also have CRISPR uh, knocked out uh, soon. Uh, all this was done in uh, 77 cell lines but 
uh, there is a core of about 10 to 12 uh, cancer cell lines that were mostly used. And in their publication, they report 1.4 million gene expression profiles in total. And this number is going to double in the next uh, release of their data. So this is the paper that they published three years ago or two and a half years ago that described the first uh, one million profiles from the L1000 platform. And in the paper, they visualized the, the drugs or subset of the drugs using this um, approach where each drug is uh, placed on this map based on the signature similarity. And they divided their data into um, the genetic perturbation, biologics, and the smoke molecule perturbations. And uh, they have this discovery portion and the touchstone reference portion. And we were also a part of this um, a consortium that this data was generated from. So we had uh, early access to the data and we applied our own computational methods to process and analyze this data. And we came up with um, this uh, app called L1000FWD. And L1000FWD, it's uh, visualizing more points on a map and it is at the signature stage, like the map that you saw from the broad, it was at the drug level. This is at the signature level, so you can have the same drug having multiple signatures. So signature is defined as the changes in gene expression uh, applied by a specific drug and a specific dose where gene expression was measured at a specific time point in a specific cell line. Uh, so we have 17,000 of those uh, drug-induced uh, signatures. This is still a small subset of the whole thing. It covers uh, 3,713 drugs. Uh, but what we've done, we really only took the most consistent uh, and the best sort of like signatures. And a lot of the drugs, they don't do anything to the cells. So you treat the cells, but there's no significant difference. But those 17,000 signatures, we feel strongly that those are good. And then we apply this uh, force-directed layout algorithm to cluster those signatures. And we tried many different types of algorithm, and this algorithm really worked the best. And you can see that the drugs are clustered by their mechanisms of action. So uh, you can see that, for example, this arm at the bottom that has the green uh, points, those are HDAC inhibitors. So all of the HDAC inhibitors that were profiled, they all cluster together. And you also, they cluster together with some gray uh, points. So those gray points are small molecules without an assigned function. So immediately, just by eye, without machine learning, you can identify novel HDAC inhibitors. And then you can do the same for other classes of drugs. So the, here, for example, this is tubulin uh, polymerization inhibitors. Those are MEK inhibitors. Uh, those are uh, glucocorticoid. So all of those have those gray points, which are drugs without assigned function. So this is exciting because, uh, and what this is like, for example, a coloring by batch. So in the L1000 data, there was a lot of batch effects. So we're able to remove those batch effects. Uh, and this is shown here. The fact that you see all the colors mixing, that's a good thing. This is automatic clustering of the, the entries on the map. And this is coloring by cell line. And this is also important. You can see that some of those clusters are cell tap agnostic, but some of those uh, responses, those responses to drug are very cell type specific. So for example, this arm here is only uh, seen that type of reaction to the drugs only seen in VCAP cells. But here you can see that there it, the response is cell type agnostic. All the drugs have represent all the cell types have representative in this cluster. So those 
drugs, for example, those are um, CDK inhibitors and topoisomerase inhibitors that interrupt the cell cycle. And in general, we want to see those um, agnostic effects of drugs. So some of those drugs are already launched drugs. So the orange drugs have been launched. The um, red ones are preclinical and there's also drugs in different phases of clinical trials and there's a lot of drugs also here that haven't been tested in people yet but again to get the picture that those could be uh, moved quickly to getting tested in probably in animal models first but you can get those uh, predictions right away this is looking at the structure of those drugs so there was a lot of argument in general in the field or a lot of hope that if you have a chemical structure you'll be able to predict the changes in expression and you can see here that it's not completely random so a lot of people are thinking that the structure doesn't really relate to what uh, the drug is actually doing to a cell but you can see for some structure they all fall into the same uh, area on the map that means that those drugs even though they're not the same drug they're similar drugs structurally and they're causing a similar cellular effect so one other thing that we've done we connected this data to the data on, uh, on the Mount Sinai EHR uh, this is the old version of the EHR where we were able to see on the map uh, which drugs are actually used in the Mount Sinai EHR and where they fall so you see that there is some drugs that are used the one that have a color all the gray ones are not used in the EHR and then we can zoom in into the map and you can look at a specific drug so these for example Ida Rubicin is a drug that used it's a launch drug that used in the Mount Sinai EHR it's a topo isomerase inhibitor and we can further dig down dip, uh, dig and see the genes that uh, in that particular signature so this is a report of a signature that it was tested in PC3 cells uh, 10 micromolar uh, gene expression was measured uh, after six hours and you can get the up and down genes and then you can further analyze them for example with enricher this is just just gem general information about the drugs that we fetched from databases and this is the uh, diagnosis from the Mount Sinai EHR that were assigned to this drug and this drug in general is used for um, uh, various types of uh, leukemias and uh, neutropenia and uh, this is sort of like the indication of the drug but you can see that it's also used for other things and also this is a plot that shows the uh, co-prescribed drugs with this drug and uh, the last one is the um, drug use over time over age so you can see that this drug in general is prescribed to people uh, between I guess 45 and 75